My name is Garrett Reppenhagen. I served as a scout, 19 Delta, with uh, 263 Armored Battalion, 1st Infantry Division, out of Vilsack, Germany. I deployed with the scouts to Kosovo for nine months on a peacekeeping mission and to Iraq for a year between February 04 to February 05 in OAF 2. I was stationed in and around Bakuba at a forward observation base called Skunyan, right across the street from Warhorse. Bakuba is about 35 miles northeast of Baghdad, and it's within the Sunni Triangle. My experience in Kosovo with my fellow scouts, we learned very well uh, how to operate with strict rules of engagement. It was a peacekeeping mission, stability and support. And we operated for those nine months under those premises, basically as cops with a little bit more leniency on ability of use of force. So when I got back uh, to Germany, I went to train at the International Interdiction Course in Stettin, Germany. It's a NATO-operated, uh, basically, special forces training where we uh, hurried through uh, sort of sniper training. And I became uh, a scout uh, sniper for the US Army. We, uh, we operated in that time before going to Iraq. We, uh, we did a lot of classrooms in a classroom setting about rules of engagement, about Geneva Conventions about how to operate in an environment of war. These things we already knew, but they were reinforced, and we had many new soldiers that need to catch up. We also trained in the field, uh, basically role-playing situations on what to do, what not to do, and how to use force properly. I found when I got to Iraq in February that many of that was thrown out the window. My first mission was a right seat ride with the unit that we were replacing. We had half of our men and half of their men go out, and they got to show us the sector that we were going to operate in for the next year. At the time, there was a curfew in our operation where Iraqis were not supposed to be outside of their houses after dark. We rolled around our sector, and eventually we came upon two men that were in the field. They were out after curfew, and they were not U.S. military or coalition forces. The men on the gun basically proceeded to open fire on these men, killing both of them where they stood. After the firing was through, we got off the trucks and we moved out to the location of where the bodies were. Half the men remained with the trucks and guarded them and stayed on the guns and overwatched our movement. The rest of us went out to check. They were using 50 caliber machine guns, which is basically what was already described, almost salt shaker sized rounds flying out of this fully automatic weapon that's accurate range is almost about 2,000 meters. Mark 19, fully automated, belt-fed grenade launchers, where you hold the butterfly down and grenades fly out the other end. These weapons' primary use is for basically anti-vehicle weapons. In the, our rules of engagement that we just learned a month prior, we were not supposed to use these weapons on civilian enemy. Once we got to these men, they were blown into pieces. There was no sign of any sort of weapons, any sort of anything upon them. I was told by the sergeant, scout, that we were replacing that these men were out in their fields farming because the periodic electricity in their town, the pumps that irrigated their fields only operated while they had electricity, which meant to farm their fields, sometimes they had to go out into the dark, knowingly risking the curfew to farm their fields. I asked the sergeant why did he fire upon these men if he knew that they were farming in their field after he explained to me why they were there. And he told me because they were out after curfew. This was my sudden shock to realize that what I had just learned about rules of engagement were rapidly changing. I never got another rules of engagement briefing while I was in Iraq for that year. I was never updated on what changed or who I was able to shoot at we just basically changed them ourselves. It was very slow at first as we kind of eased into it. We learned to push the envelope a little bit at a time. And basically we learned that, oh, we didn't get in trouble for that? Well, let's try this. By the time I left Iraq, it was pretty much fair game to shoot at anybody that we thought were, was a threat. I was not surprised to see that many of these went unreported. And when they were reported on, most of the documents and the reports that were signed 
by members who witnessed, service members who witnessed these, these events were basically falsified or people that did see these events happen said they didn't see it. It's very difficult in a combat environment to work alongside the men and women that are saving you every single day and watching your back to tattle on them when an accident happens. Much more so when the, the definitions of an atrocity is so blurred in a combat environment. One time, I was with the personal security detachment for a military intelligence major. We were supposed to be going out monitoring mosques on basically what they were saying over the loudspeakers to the, to the surrounding village. Since they were in Arabic, we brought an interpreter, interpreter to inform us what was going on. While we got to our trucks that morning, we found out that Khalees was under attack in a nearby town. And the mortars were in the middle of the town in the Joint Command Center where all the major government buildings were in town and they were pretty much surrounded by insurgents. The military inte intelligence major was very excited to get into combat. For most of his time in Iraq, he worked behind a desk. And he was not yet out into a combat mission. Much less the majority of the personal security detachment had not been engaged yet either, despite the fact that we've been in Iraq for months. Many of them were made up of cooks, mechanics, supply personnel, Many of these men were either soldiers that their unit didn't want and wanted to get rid of and put them into this detachment, or they felt that they were the best for the job and wanted to be represented by the best men from their platoon. But regardless, many of them had no combat experience and no understanding of rules engagement. We rolled out the gate into Khalees. The man that was supposed to be on the machine gun of my truck was too afraid to operate his weapon and he found out that he was even unable to load the weapon properly because he was so excited and scared. I was ordered by the, the major to basically take his place. And I got on this weapon and it was, a, it was an M60 machine gun. It was an old Vietnam era weapon. I had never even seen since I've been in the military. It was the first one I, I ever seen. So after learning how to load this weapon and operate it, we rolled out the gate. We got to a little intersection in Calice and before us, we saw smoke rising up from the town and we heard gunfire and we heard explosions. And there was a circular perimeter of uh, Iraqi police and army trucks, just white pickup trucks, blocking off the perimeter of this traffic circle. And they would drive into this circle and a truck would move out of the way and let a truck in and pull back forward. And it'd be full of men, and men basically military aged men, in the back of the truck that were getting pulled out by MPs and getting beat up and zip strip, and some were even being shot in that traffic circle. The major was dismounted and walking around, and my buddy, who was also a sniper, there was only two, two of the snipers that were asked to come along on this mission, was out with them. And he was being told that the deputy governor of the Diala province house was under attack, and there was nobody there to defend him. So we got back in our trucks, and we made a sharp left away from Khalees to the deputy governor's house. On the ride there, we came upon in the medium a pickup truck parked facing away from us. There were men armed, about five of them, in the back of the pickup truck. And one of them had an RPG, and it was pointed across a long, long marshy field. And across that field was the deputy governor's house. Immediately pulled the trucks over in a uh, herringbone, basically. One truck just staggered, facing in different directions, trying to give everybody an equal opportunity to fire. I watched the man in the RPG slowly turn and look at me in the eye and look back at the deputy governor's house. I did not react hostilely, nor did anybody else in the pickup truck. After a moment went by, I finally heard the, the major yelling, fire, fire, why the hell aren't you firing? The truck that the major was in began to fire upon this truck, and all the following trucks proceeded to fire upon him. Basically, we ripped this pickup truck to hell. All the men in the back of it were torn into shreds, and we continued to fire on the, on the vehicle. My weapon malfunctioned, and I was only able to fire one shot at a time. Later, I found out that the, the spring in the, in the feed cover tray was, was basically broken, so I could only fire one shot, so I'd have to reload the weapon 
aim and fire. Reload the weapon, aim and fire, which is supposed to be a fully automatic belt fed gun. I was using in single shot, almost like a sniper. I was able to acquire my targets and fire upon the men. In this confusion, a vehicle driving towards us right after the combat was initiated, basically must have realized that too late, he was in the middle of a combat zone. And he decided to try to drive past us as quickly as possible rather than try to stop and turn around and go the other way. The lead truck vehicle fired his Mark 19 into that, into that car as it sped towards us. And I watched the round basically shatter the window, go inside, and almost just a, a light and a smoke erupted on the inside of the vehicle, and it tore off to the right into, into an embankment. I was able to fire two rounds through the windshield before, before it basically ran into a berm and spun there, basically, for a moment. And I watched smoke trail out of the holes that I had created in the windshield from the grenades that, that exploded inside. And, uh, in the mass of confusion, it's almost startling how little control you have and how much fear perpetuates you to not really concern yourself with things like rules of engagement and Geneva Conventions. Basically, your primary concern is getting yourself and your buddies home alive. And you realize that you're fighting for blue team and they're on A team. And it really doesn't matter what ideologies or why you're fighting anymore because you're there and you are fighting. Even though these men never fired a single round back at us, we were able to kill five of the men in the pickup truck and two men in this car that ran off the side of the road. At one point, the passenger of the car fell out the passenger side when trying to crawl towards one of the tires to seek protection from the tire. I had a very clear angle at the man, and I was hearing replies that there was gunfire coming from the vehicle, which I couldn't tell but I had to take the word for it, so I began to shoot this man again and again with the M60, reloading a single shot, aiming and firing into his belly. Eventually the man stopped moving, and eventually everybody stopped firing one after another. And it's kind of funny because I don't know if somebody ran out of ammo or if somebody said cease fire and nobody else heard it but one person, he stopped firing, the next stop person stopped firing, the next person stopped firing, and finally we all stopped firing. And there were some men that were laughing, some men that were crying, and I was just scratching my head. And the Iraqi army who had assembled behind us were waiting for us to stop firing, moved in pretty quickly. They covered the vehicles and they kicked all the weapons out into a circle. And I watched one of the Iraqi policemen raise his hands to his head in kind of a, oh my God, sort of look. And I was like, what, you know, what, what? And all the rest of them sort of joined in, and you know, I realized something was, was very terribly wrong. And finally, it trailed back to us that these men that we had just killed were the deputy governor's bodyguards. Many of them were off-duty policemen and army, Iraqi army officers, that were trying to seek additional money by supporting and basically getting a job with the deputy governor to protect him. So all these men, basically, in the vehicle, in the men in the car, were not only innocent, but in a coalition, they were our allies. And it was basically fratricide. This is the kind of confusion that goes on every day in Iraq. Whether it's innocent civilians that we can't understand who they are or what they're doing, and there's muzzle flashes, and we just eliminate the enemy and they're in the way. Or, you know, whether it's men in a field that, you know, we assume are innocent anyways, but we don't even give them the benefit of the doubt and we shoot them regardless. These things happen over and over again. And we don't have many photos of it. We don't have many stock footage of it. If we did, there'd be more Abu Ghraib scandals, and there'd be more Hadithas, and there'd be more Mike Greens that we can learn about. But all we do have is our testimonies. And hopefully, with the courageous uh, efforts of Iraq veterans against the war, we can continue to bring these to light. The men I served with were honorable soldiers. They were professionals. They went to Iraq hoping to do good, hoping to do right. They went to Iraq to defend their country, to defend their neighbors, and defend their citizens. However, we found rapidly that that was not the case, that we were killing the Iraqi people in horrible ways, and we had to. We had to do it to protect ourselves and to operate our missions in the most safety that we could possibly do it. And most soldiers are going through this. 
whether they've seen a true atrocity or not. The truth of the matter is that the war is the atrocity. Thank you.